It is the year 1680. In the English colony of Massachusetts stands the Adams House. Mother Adams finishes cooking breakfast over blazing logs in the big fireplace, just as Father Adams comes in carrying two buckets of water swinging from a wooden yoke on his shoulders. The fireplace is the center of most household activities. Breakfast will be hasty pudding made of cornmeal, served in wooden plates called trenchers. As usual, Rebecca Adams and her younger sister, Cynthia, help their mother. They have moved the trestle board up near the fire. With a ladle made from a gourd, mother dips milk from the homemade wooden bucket. Mr. Adams is a well-to-do Massachusetts farmer and a devout one. Rebecca and Cynthia stand respectfully at their places, and Brother Jonathan too, while Father says grace. Heavenly Father, bless thou this food to the good of our bodies, that we this day may walk in thy path. Go with us as we work, and shelter us from all harm. Amen. Now that grace has been said, Rebecca, Cynthia, and Jonathan may be seated and begin their meal. Cynthia is proud of her silver cup, made by a silversmith of Boston. Jonathan's trencher is heaped with good hasty pudding, made of the meal from their own Indian corn. Milk is a food important to all, especially now in late fall. There are no more fresh vegetables. The Adamses eat their breakfast in silence. Children are to speak only when spoken to. And Father Adams is quiet because his mind is occupied with thoughts of work for the day. It is a rule among the colonists to stop eating when only moderately full. After breakfast, Cynthia attends little Daniel, the only one of the children born in America. Jonathan's first job for the day is to make a new splint broom for his mother. A stick of red birch has been softened in water, and now Jonathan needs only a sharp knife. Thin strips or splints are carefully peeled back toward the end and folded over each other. The remainder of the stick is whittled down to form the handle. While Jonathan works, mother keeps the fire going. Additional splints are used to bind those in the broom together. Mother, I finished the broom. You are a good son, Jonathan. While father chops firewood, the children study. How be thy name? T-H-Y-K-I-N-G-E-R-M-C-O-M-E Thy kingdom come. Jonathan is reading his New England primer. He who now learns his ABC forever will a blockhead be. But he who to his books inclined will soon a golden treasure find. A. In Adam's fall we sin it all. B. Thy life to men this book attend. C. The cat doth play and after slay. D. A dog will bite a thief at night. E. An eagle's flight is out of sight. F. Rebecca has come over to see how lessons are progressing. But something outside causes her to look up. It must be something unusual. What is it, Jonathan? A fox. It must be the one that got our chickens last week. A fox. There's a reward for the one who kills him. The Adam's long-barreled musket is heavy for Jonathan, but father is away in the woodlot. The fox may soon be off, and Jonathan is eager for the reward. Mother, Jonathan shot the fox. How oh, wonderful. Oh, what a beautiful fox. See, Mother, I shot it. What a fine big one. 
Yes, and now he claims a bounty, too. Yes, it's three shillings sixpence, isn't it, Father? That's right, Sam. Here, let me take it. Three shillings sixpence. One shilling to put aside toward his gun, with some left over. And here is Jonathan's list. Save for gun, one shilling. Knife, one and six. Fish hooks, three pence. Comb, three. Sweetmeat, six. In the afternoon, neighbors arrive at the Adams house. Good day, Mistress Adams. Welcome, friends. Won't you come in? It is very kind of you to help me make my fine new quill. It is always a pleasure to help a friend. And only right that we should come, for you helped us last spring. Oh, Polly. Will you not take off your cloaks? Good day, Rebecca. It's good to see you. I'm so glad you came. Cynthia and Polly are always glad to see each other. Making quilts is tiresome work, and Mrs. Adams' neighbors help her, just as she helped them. The decorated cloth came from India. When Cynthia and Polly are older, they too will help make quilts. They too will have to spin and weave and sew, and make candles and soap. Just now they play Cratch Cradle, Meanwhile, the quilting goes on. Mrs. Adams and Polly's mother are rubbing colored chalk on a piece of cord. This is stretched tightly. And now, when the string is plucked, a straight chalk line is left on the cloth. Cynthia and Polly have put aside their game. Young as they are, they have already learned to do useful work. On this hand loom, Cynthia is making a strip of tape for the tyings and lacings needed for homespun clothing. Polly works on a piece of needlework, making letters and samples of stitches. So the cloth is called a sampler. Both Polly and Cynthia someday will have to make cloth and sheets and towels, dresses and suits and bonnets. This my sampler here you see what care my mother took of me. Such work was a part of the early training of these colonial women, without whose skilled fingers quilts could not be made. Hands prepared the wool for the quilt, hands made the thread for the quilt, and hands guide the needles. Evening, and time for lighting candles homemade candles of tallow or wax. In the evening, as always, home life centers around the fire in the big brick fireplace, the fire that is kept steadily burning for cooking, for warmth, and for light. Father, tired from a day of work on his farm, sits down for a quiet smoke. With pipe tongs, he picks up a live ember to light his pipe. Then he rests contentedly, perhaps thinking of the friends he left behind in England six years ago. For the women of the household, evening does not mean an end of work. There is wool to be spun by candlelight. There is cloth to be woven by candlelight, woven on the handmade loom, woven by tireless hands that have learned both skill and patience. Jonathan shells corn to be ground into meal. Now Rebecca fills the warming pan with hot coals. Beds are upstairs, and the warming pans will make cold beds more comfortable. The day comes to a close with Father's reading of the scriptures. Of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. There shall be no evil befall thee, 
neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. 